All right, guys. So I meant to hit the hootie hoo, but it didn't hootie hoo. So we're going to hootie hoo. Hootie hoo. Okay. So we hootie hooed. Uh, welcome to episode 58. We're off to a fantastic start already, as you, te- as you can tell. Uh, actually, it is a really great episode. Forget the intro. Um, just enjoy this one. And uh, yeah, I'll give you a small update at the very end episode of what I've been through, but or what I've been doing. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that too. All right, guys. Thanks. All right, guys. So we are here with another one. Uh, I feel like I just say this and repeat because I do so many of these now. Um, but again, I keep searching the world for fascinating guests and my next guest is uh falls into that category um i met her on a pod match which is where i've met a lot of my guests lately um and uh so why don't you tell us your name and obviously where you're from and what's your condition so hi listeners my name is shelly hauser i am a congenital hemipelvectomy and I live in uh, Northeast Philadelphia area, about an hour west of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, so. you said you're in Northeast Philly? Well, it's it's just outside of Philly, about okay. an hour west of Philadelphia. Okay. I was going to so. say, because I lived in Northeast Philly for 22 years, so. Well, no. Okay. Not uh, quite in the city, a little outside. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, obviously half the people are going to hear these big words you just said as far as what your condition is. So uh, can you tell us what that condition is? Yeah. Yeah. So it's one in 8 million. uh, So my physicians tell me and uh, congenital hemipelvectomy essentially means that I was born without my right hip or any part of my leg. So my skin is intact. I don't have any scars or phantom pain or phantom sensations. But the the bone structure just never um, formed. So there it is. Um, the bottom two discs of my spine off my tailbone never finished forming. So I have scoliosis, which has gotten worse after our three children, you know, pregnancies with my three children. So it's it's a rare condition. My prosthetist, my leg maker, who works out of Virginia, says to me that even though he's worked and from South Africa, he's never seen a deformity, anything like mine. So, yeah. So he did he have to kind of come up with something on the fly? Like, did he have something actually made for you? Or did he have to customize something? So when a, any amputee, whether it's a below the knee or above the knee, or a hip dysartic is to have the top crest of your hip section, um, but not the actual socket. And then there's a hemipelvectomy, which is absolutely no hip socket whatsoever. So okay. every socket needs to be customized um, because some are going to have nerve pain, some are going to have scarring, some are going to be heavy, some are going to be skinny. So every socket that is made by any prosthetist is customized. Um, but m- yeah, mine definitely has more challenges because I have absolutely nothing to work with. So the socket is made of carbon fiber metal. Mm-hmm. So the process is when you get a new socket made or a new leg made, they cast you like you cast your arm if you break it. And then they saw you out of it, which I always hate because <laughs> it's an electric saw that's like a half an inch from your skin. Mm. Um <laughs> And they saw you out of it with an electric saw. And then they make a mold of it. And the mold has to fit like a really tight shoe. It has to fit. Because I don't have that hip socket, there's all this skin, but no real muscle structure or bone structure. So it has to really compress, for me, around your waist. Um, I find that that, as I'm getting older, is harder on my digestive system because it really, really has to fit tightly to support my back and and stay on there so it doesn't fall off or pull on my spine. Right, and this so is just your uh, one hip, right? It's not both. Of yeah, them? just the right side. It's the right yeah. side. Um. So how do you how do you walk proper or you know, however you walk? But how do you do it? Yeah, that's like the million dollar question that doctors have been asking me since I've gone to Shriners Hospital. In Philadelphia, Um, got my first prosthetic at six months old. It had no knee socket, 
and a strap, like a, some sort of strap that went around my waist, I guess, when I was little. And, uh, and I got older, I started getting a knee socket. So basically the, the socket fits, I slide into it from the left side and I slide my, my right butt cheek into the socket where I sit. So it, it's underneath my right cheek and around my waist. And then there's a soft padded uh, left side. And if anybody knows what a ski boot buckle looks like in that ratchets in, that's how it closes and locks around my waist. Um, mm. So if, if I'm eating a lot of food or I gain weight or I'm having a bad day, I can just loosen it a little and still walk and not have it fall off. Um, but then there's the hip socket that's a helix hip, and it's a very smooth design. I didn't get one until about 10 years ago uh, with my first sea leg, which I'll explain what that is. But it, um, it, it flows like a natural human hip socket, not this hinge, like a door hinge that's just wiggly. And it, it took me six months to get used to that hip socket when I first got it but it, it flows. So I need to engage my stomach muscles to push the socket forward to engage the hip, which then pulls the thigh through to engage the knee and then swing the foot through. So it's 90%. I expel 90% energy being a hemipelvectomy um, to kind of get that process through. My biggest challenge now is that I've had three C-sections um, because I couldn't give birth naturally. So it's even harder for me because I have to engage what stomach muscles are left because um, they've cut through those muscles after each C-section. Right. So I find that I'm, I get more tired more easily and it's extremely important for me to try to maintain my health. And, and exercise, but it, it can be, it can be a lot. So, um, the knee is a microprocessor computer called a C, like a letter C mm -hmm. hyphen leg. Uh, there's different models. Um, Otto Bach makes mine. They're a German maker and it basically has software within it. Um, that reads where I'm at a hundred thousand times a minute. So if I'm standing and I'm leaning, too far front or left or right or backwards. It reads it if my feet are too wide apart or if I'm going too fast, stay down a hill or a flight of steps that I'm starting to lose my balance. This computer system will read the, the software and slow down like ABS brakes in your car. Very softly and gently, but very quickly, it will lock the knee. And I have not fallen since. Um, since getting this type of knee. A hydraulic knee, if you lean too far on the toe release or the ankle release, if you lean too far back or too far front, the knee will bend or what they call break, and you can just fall. And I had that happen when our youngest son was about two. And from a standing position at the top of the hall steps, I, I fell and, and hit my head and I couldn't opened my eyes for about 20 minutes. Um, pretty sure I gave myself a, a concussion, but uh, I didn't find it stable enough for me. And um, so I had to fight for about five years to get this microprocessor me. So, uh, I'm assuming and, very and, expensive. Um, this prosthetic, the way it's built and just the way the technology has um, evolved, it's it was $75,000 when I got it four years ago and they just, with the new technology coming out, it's, it's just, the price is just going to keep going up, but these are not even the best of the best. You know, the millet, there's ones out there. Um, I just interviewed my prosthetist and he was telling me about neuro electronic prosthetics where an amputee, an arm amputee or a thigh knee amputee can now have, um, neuro sensors put either in their muscles, which is myoelectronics, 
So they could be either sewn into their muscles in their arm or their leg or neuroelectronic sensors that can be put into their brain at the point in their brain where the leg would bend, you know, that part of your brain that would move your leg or move your arm right. and sew, sew them right onto your brain. It's called brain mapping. Yeah. And then there's sensors that are embedded in the socket of the arm or the leg prosthetic. And, and then you just go. It's kind of like a um, whole so new meaning to like muscle memory. It's yeah. exactly. So yeah. now they're, now they're going and they're doing nerve mapping. Um, so <laughs> it can be a lot. And then military folks, um, they get the best of the best. Right, because right. they're strong and, and they're used to being highly active. Some do actually have the ability to go back into service with a prosthetic oh, arm right. or leg. Do, so, you ever, do you ever think we'll get to a place where this stuff isn't that expensive? Not not just that, but like going to the hospital in an ambulance. Like I remember one time looking at my bill and, yeah. and it was $1,250 to go like 10 minutes. And I'm like, I was having like a really bad panic attack or whatever it was. And yeah. I, and I, like, I literally, once I saw that, and again, I didn't have to pay because my insurance is really good, but I looked, just looked at the bill and I'm like, I could have gotten a cab for 10 bucks and yeah. took a better chance. You know, I could have had the same chance, except, you know, there would have been no one trying to, you know, put a needle on me or anything. But in general, I'd have taken my chance with the cab driver for 10 bucks. Um, but yeah, do you ever think we'll ever get to a place where we just like, some of this stuff is just, because I mean, the only people who can afford that is, yeah. you know, millionaires. Because, I mean, yours yeah, is 75 I, grand. I mean, I'm sure the ones in the military are at least six figures. Yeah, they are. They literally are. Uh, yeah. And and they're amazing because even the foot and ankle setup is, is now able to be motorized. So you're not expelling so much energy. But then it's a, a heavier unit. I mean, my unit's probably one to two pounds uh, in the foot and the ankle. Um, but when you get into... Even a prosthetic robotic um, hand can be three to five pounds at the end of your arm, and that gets extremely heavy, according to my friends that are arm amputees. But I, I do, to get back to your question, I do think so because I'm seeing more and more, especially the younger generation with 3D printers. They are um, there are some independent individuals. There's a dad of a, yeah, a young yeah. boy, you know, and they just 3D print pieces and they they make them into really cool almost Lego type colors from leftover like laundry machine and there's totally that are cool too, red. The, the yeah. 3d printers. Like I remember when Jay Leno got one and he was making parts for his car, but his uh -huh. was like 300 grand or something like ridiculous. And he yeah. could afford it cause he's a millionaire, but those are slowly starting to, I mean, again, they're still really expensive, but they're starting to go down. So yeah, you're, you're right. The 3d printers yeah. is kind of going to be the way to go. So I'm seeing that more and more. Now, it, granted, that's still pretty much only for arm amputees. And I think that's only because arm prosthetics are not weight bearing. So in some right. ways, you know, they get more advanced, really cool stuff because their arms are not really weight bearing unless they're lifting weights or doing push ups right. or, you know, rock climbing or something along those lines. The legs have yeah. to support more and you have to support yeah. the whole body. And they're bigger muscles. Right. Yeah. yeah they're that's bigger muscle structures. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, yeah. I mean, hopefully we get to a place where things go way down because it's just kind of, like I said, I have good insurance and, you know, you pray for your lucky yeah. stars that you have that, but I do. I mean, other than that, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, this, this sounds like this is going to be a stupid question. I've never asked anyone this, but you know how, like, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the, you get like a letter or something that says like, if you die, your social security will give whoever 42 grand or whatever the number is. Like, yeah. do, do you think like your, your prosthetic would be calculated into that? Like, would that, would they get money for your, your, your arm too, or your hip, excuse me? You know, I don't really know. I mean, I know. That's 75 I have, grand. You're worth something. Yeah. I do have my crutches, which would be $1,200 to replace them. And I do have my prosthetic insured. Um, and it was something I never really thought of. <laughs> Uh, growing up. But when I was coming home from college one year, uh, 20 some years ago, um, I, I was coming down the side street in our town and I went to make a left and go home. And there was a woman passing me in a black Cadillac, an older woman 
and she was on my left. And so we were just, you know, passing each other. And some young kid, uninsured, of course, in his dad's car, came flying through the side alley and plowed into the both of us and thought we were at fault because there was no sign in this tiny, tiny little side alley to tell him to stop. So he had no brains about him, and he just plowed into her. Her frozen turkey went through my windshield, and I snapped the steel plate in my hip socket, and it was a $3,000 fix. Wow. And then I refused to go in the ambulance to the hospital for my broken leg. And then when I tried to file to get my prosthetic fix, they tried to deny it for a couple of weeks because they said, well, you denied medical care. I'm like, so what? I was supposed to take the ambulance to the hospital for the doctors to look at me and not be able to do a damn thing and then pay the ambulance bill on top of it. Right, right. You know, and I talked to the state trooper and I'm like, what do I do? He's like, I wouldn't go to the hospital. You're nothing's broken that you can, that the hospital can fix. So right. this was in the early nineties and it just was, dumbfounding that nobody knew what to do and that I literally had to argue with the insurance company to get it fixed. So I was on crutches for a couple of weeks. Right. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was, sorry, it's a stupid question. I just was, I was just, no. it, it's kind of like, it was just curious. Cause I'm like, does that kind of get calculated into like, I mean, you 75 grand is 75 grand. You have a $75,000 yeah. hip. Like, I don't yeah. know. Um, not that I want you to die yeah. or anyone to get your money, but you know, it's, right, right. Uh, but hey, that's that's not that's not chump change. But <laughs> I we do have it, and I would have to say the answer would be no, because under the insurance for auto or home, in case of fire or car accident, or you know the house collapses, God forbid, in, in a tornado or whatever, um, they have it listed as if it's a well, it might be as 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 if you got a, an expensive painting or a, a Ming vase from China or, you know, it's just like an expensive piece of art. And that's how it's listed under, you know, the auto insurance or, or so it would come back as some sort of value, but I'm not quite sure about it being under life insurance. Uh, but I, you know, we amputees and, and people with disabilities often talk about the fact that if there's a fire, you know, you're really just supposed to drop everything and just get out and leave all your valuables there. And and often we talk about the fact that new amputees don't realize that they should insure their prosthetics and their crutches because if there's a fire in the in the house or a gas leak in the house blows up or whatever catastrophe might happen, you're you won't have time to put your prosthetic on. I mean, for me it probably takes me maybe like a minute, minute and a half at most kind of make sure everything's in there and I'm not pinching, you know, my skin, my rib cage or anything. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because most people don't realize that they really need to do that. And, and I, I had to learn that hard lesson. So that's one thing I always try to tell new amputees that you really need to think about this because nobody really has $75,000 laying around right, to, right. to get a brand new one. Right. Um, do you, so, so like with, with the functionality in your, with, with your leg and everything, like, can you, can you run? Can you jog? Like what, what, what are the restrictions? Limit. So for me, no, I cannot because I don't have a hip and I don't have those thigh muscles. Now and above the knee has the hip and the thigh muscles to, to run and they can use those, those cool looking cheetah blades, those running blades. Oh, okay. That you see runners. Yeah. So those are called cheetah blades or running blades. Um, so an above the knee or a below the knee absolutely can. But for me or a, a hemi, a hip disarticulate, I uh, no, because we just don't have the bone structure or, or the muscle structure to do it. Right, right. Um, and it's, it's too much to kind of pull through all three sockets, you know, all three joints to get the motion going. Mm -hmm. And so I can't ride a normal two wheeled bicycle unless I would have adult size training wheels or the bicycle that I have, which is a hand crank bike. So I sit down low to the ground, the bicycles, three wheels, two in the back, one in the front. And then the gears are in front of my face and I hand, hand cycle. Um, so that's my alternative 
to mm-hmm. that. But now I do ski. Um, I three track ski. So I have one ski on my foot and then elbow cuff crutches with a small piece, maybe 18 inches of ski blade at the bottom of these crutches right. um, to help me keep my balance straight. And then there's teeth at the back end. So there's a string where my handles are. And if I push, pull, pull on the string and push the crutches down, they're in a flat mode for me to ski and balance on. And if I pull the string up, the teeth in, engage in the back and the crutches flip up. Um, and, and then I can push off on those metal blades in the back. If I'm like on a flat spot or I'm starting to take off mm-hmm. on the top of a hill or something. So, um, I've learned to rock climb indoors. We just harness differently. Yeah. Uh, I did crew in Philadelphia when I lived in West Norwich and for a couple of years, I would go down to, uh, the adaptive, uh, crewing house in Philly uh, along Kelly Avenue, Kelly, uh, where the boathouse row is. Okay. So right, right down the road is a, a green a barn that has crewing. And so we would crew uh, down along Kelly Drive there. And so I did that for a couple of years. That was really good. So do you, um, um, sorry, do, do you now, because yeah. I, I like to paint a picture of what you actually go for go through. Like, is it, is there anything noticeable? Like, do you, do you walk with a limp? Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I feel it when, when I'm tired, you know, because I wear the leg on average 13 to 14 hours a day, which for a lot of amputees, according to my process, it seems to be an exorbitant amount. But, you know, I get up at like 6, 6.30 and I, you know, you know, you do your normal thing. You get up, you take a shower, put, you know, put my leg on <laughs> right, and, right. you know, get dressed and go to work eight hours and, you know, drive to work and drive home from work. And, and then there's dinner and there's soccer for my kid and, um, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So, but, and that's the thing. If the socket fits around your, your, your residual stump or residual limb and it fits well and it's comfortable, you can wear it for that long. Right. Um, but if there's a, a bone that's sticking in your muscles or you've got bad scarring or it wasn't, um, stitched smoothly during surgery, you know, and you've got lumpiness down there, it's going to have skin breakdown because it's going to sweat and you're going to be uncomfortable. And so those are a lot of quirky little things that, that other amputees talk about. Right. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I have a limp, but um, even a below the knee would have a lip. Yeah. So gotcha. yeah, it's just is what it is. Um, so you said something to me the other day, um, you were talking about, um, having children. And I believe you said the first time was the hardest. And can yeah. you kind of talk about that other, other than like the consummation of it? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I was 20, married at 26. Took us a year to get pregnant. Um, so uh, growing up at Schweiner's Hospital in Philadelphia, every month I would have uh, x-rays, a bunch of x-rays taken on my scoliosis. Uh, in my lower back. And in the 70s and early 80s, they didn't really think about the fact that they were frying my reproductive system. And while there's no medical confirmation, because you couldn't really prove it, all the doctors I've talked to throughout my pregnancy journey have all agreed that that's probably why I couldn't get pregnant really well on my own the first two times. So, you know, they just basically fried my ovaries. So, um, so we tried with our first son, John, who's now 22. And it took us a year. I had a really great German prosthetist um, for a couple of years. He and his son were running the, the office. And I found German prosthetists to really know what they're doing. I think they were, they've been the best. Uh, they come from a really great engineering design mindset. Um, so uh, he and the son had had taken care of me for years. And they said, oh, we can try this. We can try that. We can cut the socket. We can maybe make like a tortoise shell around your belly and change it. Um, 
And, and so we had come up with a couple of ideas. And when we finally got pregnant, he, he just said, I, I don't want the liability. You're going to have to figure this out on your own. So, um, so that was like crushing to me because I, I was 28 and I wasn't sure what to do. And the internet, um, this was in 97. So the internet and Google and all this stuff, YouTube didn't exist and all this. So I emailed doctors, ob- obstetricians in Italy, Germany, and England. Nobody had any idea what to do with me. Um, I checked and I asked, should I use a belly belt? Should I be on bed rest? Should I be in a wheelchair? Um, and I said, should I see a chiropractor? You know, so I, should I get a massage? You know, like what services and help can I get? And nobody, knew, and the obstetrician at the time was like, ah, oh, do whatever you want. You'll be okay. And he just was an ass. He was a complete ass. Um, and he just, I don't think he did his job. And I don't think he wanted to think outside the box to try and help me have a safer full term uh, pregnancy. So um, I was just on crutches the whole time. And I got tendonitis in both of my hands and lost feeling in both of my arms. Uh, from the elbow on down fairly often, like every day at least, you know, with all this weight. And then one night at home, my water broke two months early and went to the hospital on a Monday. John was born via C- T-section. So it wasn't, wasn't a straight line across. It was letter cut like a letter T um, because he was actually falling out of me. And it was extremely dangerous. They said, do you feel like you have to push? And I kept saying to them Thursday, something's wrong. I'm telling you something's wrong. They're like, well, just breathe like Lamaze. I'm like, Lamaze is like in two days from now. I've never had Lamaze class, that breathing thing you do. And um, oh, Okay, I didn't know what that was. I'll be honest. Yeah, Lamaze, <laughs> Lamaze is when they teach you to breathe. Like, you know, that whole oh, okay. thing. Oh, yeah, I, oh, when you're I pregnant, never, right. I never. Yeah, yeah, I never right. had the class, so I really don't know what they teach you. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I know the I class is... Just... It I never knew what so it was you, called. You see it on TV and on the movie. So that's, that's what Lamaze class is. So Thursday I didn't eat. I was really cranky. I wasn't in pain, but I just, something's just not right. And they, and I, I hammered them. <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, you need to check me out. I'm telling you something's not right. There was nothing. So they, they hooked up this belly monitor to check the waves to see if I was in labor. And I wasn't. And finally, they took me down Friday morning because I, I really wasn't eating. And the doctor turned around and turned his back to me and said, holy shit, this kid's falling out of her. His, his arms and legs are already out in her, you know, out of her. And they turned and they said, do you have to push? And I said, no. And they said, do not push. You'll break his neck. So my husband's at work an hour away. My family's in Florida. And they were just like, we have to put you under anesthesia and get this kid out right now. So. They did. Um, he's healthy. He's like six foot tall. He's in college. He's doing great. <laughs> but uh-huh. um, but it was an emergency, and they just weren't listening to me, as what, if I didn't know. What, so, what were you like psychologically when they told you that? Like he's falling out of you. Like that's pretty surreal. It was, but I thought, you know what? There's 13 people standing around me, and this is what they do every day. And the hospital we went to in Bryn Mawr has a phenomenal. NICU, um, a neonatal uh, care unit. So John was there for about four or five weeks and they did a phenomenal job. So I realized, so I thought, okay, all I have to do is just listen to them and do what they tell me to do. So I was okay with it. But I think on the back end and even years later, I realized that I really did suffer from trauma because physically this child was not with me for four or five weeks and I was home and I was an hour away and I wasn't allowed to drive and just go sit and be with him every day. So I had to rely on somebody to take me, you know, and my husband was trying to work. Um, so I had to rely on other people. And like I said, my family was all in Florida. So it, it physically, I, my body was looking for this little being that I created. And emotionally, I felt I didn't have that time to bond with him. Because when he was so little in the NICU, he was only three pounds, 11 ounces. 
you know. And so he was really, on average, a baby is somewhere between six and eight usually. Right. Um, so he was tiny, tiny, tiny. And he couldn't breathe on his own. And so I wasn't really able to hold him all the time. And um, and he came home on a breathing monitor for is it, is like another month. Is this due to the way he was birthed? Um, I, I think it's because my water broke two months early. He just didn't have time to finish growing. Oh, well, he wasn't fully and, developed, I guess. And yeah, his lungs were underdeveloped. So he was getting a shot every month to kind of help develop his lungs because that's why they, from Monday to Friday, why they tried to keep me completely on bed rest, even to go to the bathroom or get a, sh- a bath or something. It was all in the bedroom, like in the bed, in the hospital bed, because they wanted every hour or every day I could keep John inside in the womb with another day he was developing. Right. So, um, I think besides, I mean, he has ADHD, but I think that's more genetic yeah, issue. Yeah. But, um, he otherwise, I mean, even now, I mean, he does rock climbing and, um, hiking a lot and things like that. And he's, he's fairly active. Right. So I didn't see any residual health issues like some children can have when they're born extremely early or at a low birth weight like that. Right. So, so his um, biggest trauma second, is something he can't even remember. So that's actually a good thing. Right. Yeah. So the, the second child, we went to the infertility office for a month or two, and then we got pregnant with help. Well, what made um, you want to have more kids after that? Cause that's obviously very traumatic. So uh, it was, yeah. um, I, I, I think it was the thought that we wanted more than one child. We, we agreed that, my husband wasn't as comfortable with adopting as I was. Um, and I respected that. Um, but we had been friends in college, so we, we really understood each other. But I think I, I wanted another child. I always wanted three children, which is so ironic. Even like in high school when somebody would say, how many kids do you want? And I, I always wanted three kids somehow. And I think it was just the fact that it was kind of like when somebody says, oh, you can't do this. Because even my mother said to me, oh, you know, he's beautiful, he's healthy. Just be happy you have this one. And something clicked inside of me that was like, oh, lady, game on. Like, come on, don't tell me how many kids I'm going to have and, and just be happy with one. Like, if I want two, I'm going to figure out how to have two. So it was almost like a challenge to myself. Um, and I didn't want to be told what to do as a person with a disability. So we tried it again. I was at a different prosthetist. This time he took a socket that was made of fiberglass at the time, just as, just as tough and just as stiff. And it was connected in the front, uh, not on the side, uh, by two Velcro straps across the, the, at the belly button, you know, across the front. So what we did was we, um, we cut it back more and more and more and ground the edges out and made the Velcro straps just sewed longer pieces of Velcro onto the existing straps. And I was able to um, wear that prosthetic socket until four to five weeks before scheduled C-section with my second child. And that morning, I was actually in labor at the hospital while they were prepping me for the C-section scheduled. So he was ready. I was ready and everything came out great and it was completely full term. He was actually seven pounds, one or two ounces. So, and then I was back in that socket about four weeks after that C-section scar um, healed below my belly button. And I was able to get in my socket at short intervals, maybe an hour here and there, uh, and then build up my strength again and learn to walk again. With John's first pregnancy, um, I was on crutches for a year and a half because my rib cage spread wide and I carried very high and, um, and the, the insurance company told me on the phone that I needed to lose all the baby weight before they would allow me to get a new socket, but I can't run. I couldn't walk on the treadmill because my crutches were too wide. Um, can't do aerobics, can't do sit-ups because I'm on my tailbone when I do that. I can't run because it was working my shoulders, which were already overworked and sore. 
and they wouldn't pay for any physical therapy for me in any way. So I had to figure it all out on my own. And it took me that long. And by then, I was so sore that I had to go to the chiropractor for three years to kind of get my shoulders and my neck and my back back in some, some shape. And somewhat foolishly, I went on to have a second child. So, so Jesse turned out just totally fine. He's 19 and he's in college. Um, and then we moved out of West Norriton into the suburbs a little bit more away from Philly. And we were painting the house and I was working and the kids were great and everything was great. And Christopher, Jesse was going to kindergarten. He was five. John was seven, almost eight. And um, things were going really, really well. And I, we went camping and I was throwing up everywhere when I was camping. And it wasn't extremely hot and it was in the woods and I thought I was sick. And of course you think the worst, you know, oh, I'm dying. Something's wrong. Right. And turns out, turns out I was 10 weeks pregnant naturally. <laughs> wow. um, so I was dumbfounded because we really thought we were done with two and I thought we'd be fine. So ironically, I was already 10 weeks pregnant. So there's three sections. A woman is pregnant basically nine months and there's three trimesters, three, six, nine. Right. right? And so um, I had already missed my whole first section when you're supposed to be tired and nauseous and feel disgusting and everything else. And so I was already, you know, into my second trimester and we had sold all of our baby stuff, the crib and the pillow and the cradle and the whole bit. And I was going to go back to work full time. Mm -hmm. So like, Oh, good God. So we went through the same process as we did with Jesse and Christopher was full term. I was back in my leg within a few weeks again. Um, and it went extremely well. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so like, you know, before we get into, I think, you know, trying to educate all the people with disabilities out there and the stuff they don't know. Um, yeah. what, uh, is there any other challenges that you've gone through over the, your time of dealing with like, what, what has been some of the hardest times as far as having a disability? I think, um, and it kind of parlays into what we're going to talk about. Cool. I, I think society. You yeah. know, when I was pregnant with John at 28 years old, I was on crutches because I couldn't wear my prosthetic. I was six months pregnant. And I was going into a Joanne Fabric store in East Norton. And an old guy came out and walked past me. And I was walking into the store. And he's like, hey, what are you doing? And I just thought he was talking to somebody in the parking lot. I wasn't listening. And he's like, lady, what are you doing? And I turn around. I'm like, I'm going into the store. I said, you know, what's, what's your problem? And he said, that. And he pointed at my stomach, my pregnant belly. And it was a beautiful summer day in June. I was feeling really good. I was healthy. I was eating a lot of great foods. I don't smoke. I didn't drink through my pregnancies. So I was like, what the hell? And I said, what's your problem? He's like, who the hell would get you pregnant? What kind of mother do you think you're going to be to this kid? Right. And he went on and on and on. And this was in 97, 98, 98 at that point. Yeah. So it's not like, like 50 years ago. And I'm thinking, who the hell are you? Yeah. And, and I was just dumbfounded because I was really raised to not, you know, that whole be a good Christian, turn the other cheek and don't offend somebody. Right. And that was the first time in my life that I found my voice as a person with a disability. Yeah. And and some, I I'm was, sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. In, no, okay. in some ways, because I, you're like the second or third per mother that I've interviewed that has said uh -huh. that as far yeah. as the ones with disabilities. And it's almost like we're equated to people uh, who are into incest. Like it sounds wrong, but you know, they say yeah. they shouldn't mix because you're yeah. going to end up with a special needs child or something similar. And right, a lot right. of them think like, Oh, okay. So if you have, you know, if you have some sort of disability, you're going to pass it on to your kid and now you're ruining their life. And it's like, yep. not all this is genetics, you know, and like, even like, right. like mine isn't, but yours, right. and again, yours is, you know, again, actually before, before you go into like, is yours some sort of genetic thing? Is it something that happened in the womb? Um, how, how do no, you know? It, yeah, no, nobody knows and nobody will ever know. My mother was, my mom and dad got married at 19. Um, they're still married. 
uh, there are 75 now. And my I have an older sister who's three years older than I. And then my parents got on to um, uh, having a second child. And she lost the child. I was just talking about this with her recently. She lost the child within the first three months of the pregnancy. Um, and, and that seems to be extremely typical um, that women right. lose a child. And, and then she, about a year and a half later, she went on and got pregnant with me. And then I was born two months early with this anomaly. Now, I'm, so, I'm assuming your mother and father do not have this condition, right? Absolutely not. Nobody in my family. This is one in eight million. Right. So, right. Exactly. no. I mean, I had scoliosis, but my bottom two spinal discs didn't close all the way. They're like an open flower, I'm told. So, that, and, and my aunt has scoliosis. My oldest son, John, has scoliosis. Can you, um, can you tell people, for the people who don't know what that is, can you tell people what scoliosis is? So scoliosis is the curvature of your spine. And mine actually is scoliosis and lordosis. So my spine, when you're an amputee, your spine will naturally grow over your sound limb, the limb that you still have, right? Um, or if you're an arm amputee, it will go towards the arm you still have. And it's just a natural progression. Um, so it'll move left to right. And sometimes it'll look like the letter C. And sometimes it'll curve to look like the letter S in your back rather than that nice straight skeleton we always see in science class. Lordosis is when your spine starts to push forward from towards your belly button. So okay, mine wow, goes okay. forward towards my belly button on, at the bottom from my waist on down. So it's at the bottom Just of the my bottom, spine. Right, right, right. Yeah, and it can be wherever. And it can even be into your neck. So it can be anywhere from your tailbone to the top of your head. Um, where, where any of this can happen. So my, my, from my belly button on down, it pushes in and it curves to the left over my left leg that I do have. Right. And it's twisted like a Twizzler. Wow. So, <laughs> so now, now yeah. I, I, is, is this, is any of this due because of your actual, your, the condition we talked about earlier, is any of that caused due to the problems with your hip and how you have to, walk and so on like is, is there any connection with that or you literally just have two different problems um i think i think the way i've always had to jerk my body my torso to get the leg to move i'm sure that has worn on it over the years right. um you know naturally it was born an incomplete spine naturally having three pregnancies and I only gained like 25, 30 pounds. So it's not like I gained a ton of weight. Right. Um, but that has increased my scoliosis and my lordosis over the years, which again was the only reason we chose to have two children. So when the third came, I really knew, and I cried for six months because I was happy, but you know, that it finally naturally happened. But I was devastated knowing that it was really going to further increase my spinal issues. Right. So such a girl. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's so no, I know. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. So, so I, I didn't, I think, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I think society and their lack of inclusion and understanding and empathy is is the biggest problem of being a person with any disability. Right. Um and and the the, the sick of it is is Everyone will have a disability, mental or physical, at some point in their life. And at this rate, there are billions of it. What did you tell me? Like 1.3 billion in the world? Uh, 1.6. With disabilities? Yeah. So, okay, that's not a small ratio. No. And, and it's, I think every one in four or every one in five persons in America, at least, have some sort of disability, mental or physical. Right. And we all and know somebody like, too, like somebody has a right. child with one or whatever. Yeah, everybody knows right. at least yeah. one person. So I'm working on a speech for work. And at this point, the World Health Organization says that as of right now, there are 1 billion people in the world that use assistive technology, whether it's canes, crutches, walkers, visual aids, um, prosthetics, you know, anything that they use. And by 2030, and it's, what, 2021 now? So in nine years, they think that 2 billion of us will need uh, assistive technology. 
whether they're speech pads, you know, to help you speak if you're a nonverbal person with autism or a stroke person, you know, somebody with stroke or, or whatever. Um, so this is no small market. Well, that and people, I think more and more disabilities are being discovered too. And yeah. I think more is, I mean, because some people really do add people who have mental problems, not just like, uh-huh. you know, someone who has special need, but someone literally who just is, you know, has a lot of bad demons and, and, and you know, yeah. mental health. Um, and, yeah. you know, now there's the whole term of uh, like invisible disabilities. So That's like right. there's a lot that people are discovering. So two mil- two billion is very possible because, like I said, you know, we're at one point six, one point eight, whatever it was. That's uh-huh. not too far from two. And, uh, you know, yeah. So the more they discover, the more we'll find out like, OK, this is a disability, too, and this and this and that. And then all of a sudden it's like, OK, yeah, we're at two. So, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's where we're headed. But, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, that whole mindset of, and I still, the community of of amputees at least still hear it to some degree of, well, your parents did something wrong. Right. And they they had some sort of sin and they're, this is God's way of getting back to you. And I I heard that quite often growing up. Right. They they use the religious stuff, even though you are religious and it's something you believe in, they use it in a weird, like, and and these are the people that are supposedly just as God-fearing as you are, and they're the ones right. kind of using it against you actually as a weapon. Like, well, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So, And it's just, I think it's society's way of just being uncomfortable. And I don't know if they're uncomfortable because they fear that they're going to look like one of us one day. Right. And, um, but they, society can get really nasty. I mean, but I, I wear fairings over my my computer me now and they're they're plastic 3d printed um covers kind of like a cell phone cover you know they come in different colors and different shapes and and um you can mix and match and and change the colors out and and they protect the prosthetic i was gonna say yeah because it is a computer so you do need a computer a, a cover on your phone to protect it, or you do need a cover on your laptop to kind of protect it a little bit. Is there a But they're in different... Um, no, but it's really hard plastic. Is it like a so, knee pad? Um, no, it goes from the ankle up to the top of your knee. Oh, and you measure there. the length mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. So it goes from the top of your knee to the ankle, and then you measure the, the size of your calf on the leg you do have. Right. Um, and so then they know how to make, how round to make it. Um, but I have a teal blue and white one. I have a pink and bronze one. I have a black and gold floral one. Do you match your and outfits have, with it? I do. Sometimes oh, I, I do. It. I love it. And then, and then this aqua blue one, I actually, I was something I had never done before as a kid. I never painted my toenails as a kid because I figured, oh, I only have one foot. Why would I bother? But I actually found teal blue, um, nail polish. Because all those crazy colors are out there that people wear now. And I got a shade lighter and a shade darker. And then I painted my fingernails and I painted all of my toenails. But I didn't paint my toenails until I was in my 30s. Right. Because I just didn't think I could. Right. I'm sorry. I don't, I, it, it's so, yeah. I hate that one problem doing these interviews, especially when you're not in person, you can't just like throw your hand up and go like, Hey, exactly. cause there's somebody, cause and, and I'm so invested. No in, right. I'm so invested in this, but it's like, I, I'll get yelled at if I don't ask questions and then I'll think like I should ask that. Um, yeah. can you, can you get that wet? Like how do you shower? Um, so there are some amputees that choose to have or, or get shower prosthetics or, um, swim legs. Right. Um, but somebody from my level would never have one because it just wouldn't work. Okay. Um, because again, I don't have a thigh to, to kick it and move it. But you can you can switch out if you're a if you're a um, thigh or a, an above the knee or a below the knee amputee. You can uh, take a Allen wrench and take your prosthetic foot off and attach a like a flipper foot if you're swimming in the ocean, and mm-hmm. that kind of helps them move through. Um, but for showering, there's some sort of, um, I guess it's just a basic socket that's plastic, um, that they take from your original mold and then they just have like a titanium pipe to a really basic foot that won't rust and they put it in the shower and they do that in the shower. Now, since I'm congenital, I just stand and balance in the shower. 
I mean, there's a grab bar naturally in there anyway, in the shower stall. But I mean, I can close my eyes and scrub my hair and, you know, and balance on one leg. Okay. Now, it was absolutely more of a challenge, and I used a shower bench when I was pregnant because <laughs> there, was, right, right. there was a lot of weight balance issues there. Yeah, especially going forward. Um, right. Yeah. So, and I, I don't swim with anything. And I go in the ocean. Uh, I learned to swim when I was like about a year old, my mom said. She took me to the Y. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, she dropped me in the water and off I went. So, awesome. and I'm grateful for that. Right. You know, that yeah. I know how to swim. Sorry, so, yeah. to take, sorry to take you off the path. Um, oh, that's okay. But right, yeah, we were we were talking about just you know society and how you're treated as someone with a disability yeah. and what the challenges. I think in some ways we're getting better um, in society. You're starting to see more. Well, there was a just this week there was a article, a letter written to I guess Hollywood executives in general, where seventy or eighty famous actors or producers or whatever signed a letter, including Amy Poehler, the uh, right, comedian, right. Yeah. Uh, saying that there needs to be authentic representation and that, um, you know, there's been numerous actors or actresses that have played persons with disabilities, mental or physical. Forrest and yet only, t- yeah, and only 2% of those actors really were authentically, truly yeah. had a disability. Right. Um, so there's a push. Jay Ritterman from the Ritterman Family Foundation, who I interviewed not long ago. Um, I just put this yesterday on my Facebook page about this whole article that I did with Jay Ritterman when I interviewed him um, about how he works with authentic representation. And Zach Gottensagen, who starred in The Peanut Butter Falcon with Shia LaBeouf, um, walked the red carpet and presented an Oscar. And that was the first time in history that a person with a disability presented and walked the red carpet. The other push that's happening right now in Hollywood is the demand for some sort of ramp. Because if a person with a disability wins an award, they have to go up through the back entrance, around through the back of the stage, and then out on the stage. There's no way with that large staircase that it's accessible for anybody with a disability. Yeah. So they couldn't um, imagine us even being there in the first place, so... Right. I mean, I would need to hold somebody's hand to get up because I take one step at a time because I can't lift my side of, you know, move to the next step. So when I take the steps, I go one at a time up or down. Right. So that would take me forever to get up those steps, you know, and then I would have to shut, you know, close my speech shorter mm-hmm. um, if I was ever in that situation. So, um, so society is starting to push for authentic representation you know there's a a photograph of a young girl who uh, is in a wheelchair and she her mother took this picture they were in front of an Ulta beauty store makeup store and um, there was a woman in makeup and hair in a wheelchair and her daughter was dumbfounded and it stopped her uh, because she had never seen herself represented as something beautiful um so we're starting to see things in commercial Target has an ad right now with a wheelchair user in it waiting in line to be checked out. Um, so we're starting to see that change. And those are some things that I was hoping to see in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we have a, a really far way to go uh, right. in a lot of ways. The stigma, the stigma and the microaggressions and the biases that stick really need to come from the top down to say, we can do better and we as a society need to do better. Right. Well, I think we had a really good conversation the other day about just some of the things that uh, the average person with a disability does not know. Like they're just sit there. I mean, we were talking about like the disability rules and all that, but can you talk about the one thing you said that I felt was very interesting was the, um, uh, you were, you were talking about what a a disabled person should say in an interview as far as their condition. Yeah. So, Persons with any kind of disability have been protected since July 26th of 1990 with the American Disabilities Act that was signed by George W. Bush. And there are five titles, five sections that are covered under the ADA. Um, Everybody can find them online if you Google it. Um, And so it is that you can get employment is the first one. And which I think is one of the most important ones. And then I think title for me, title five, I think is the 
second biggest one. But underemployment, if anybody with a physical or mental, visible or invisible um, disability it must know that by law, when they go in for any interview throughout the whole entire process, it is their right to not mention anything about their disability until the job offer has been handed to them and has been agreed upon. And the employer or the hiring manager or the recruiter is not by law allowed to ask or mention anything about said disability that's either seen or perceived. Right. At that time, once the job offer is given and agreed upon, then is it is the person, the new employee's responsibility to mention if and when they feel that they need to tell anybody. You know, you can work at a company for 20 years and never once mention what your disability is. And by law, you have the right to do that. Um, if you need something called reasonable accommodations, they can be as simple as um, a unit that sits on top of your desk so you can stand when you work. And people without disabilities, maybe with even just a back issue, um, will file for one of those. Can I, uh, can I throw can an get, example at you of something that yeah. maybe you can give me an answer? Because this is, this is, this happened to me and there's people okay. with different disabilities will have their own stories. But so I was trying to get a job at a call center. I don't know. I was just, I just wanted a job. Um, right, right, and it was right. one of these places that was advertising like, oh, you don't have to sign up online. You could just get the job here, which in a way was bullshit because you, you still have to go there and you have to do this, this test on the computer. Right. Um, right, right, right. and so I sat down with the woman and, and she said, okay, I'm just going to leave. Here's the thing. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't see this. Um, right. so now I have to mention my disability to her and I have to say, uh -huh. I said, can you get the magnify magnification on here? And right. I will, I will, I will do my best. Um, and she says, we can't, this is locked out of it. It's specifically the only program on here. And I'm like, well, if you can get to, out of this program, I could show you how to get to it. And I'll be fine. You right. can leave me alone for however long. And she said, right. no, we cannot do that. So for someone who so, actually yeah. has to, my, my point is, basically the example is to uh, put a spot on the fact that I actually had to address that I had a disability because the initial interview right. or whatever, I had to address it because of the, the way they did their testing or, or you know the, the interview. Right. And they were wrong for doing that because with the equal opportunity you know, a, a tag that's always at the end of every job ad, you know, and I think this falls under it by law. If you need, uh, if you have deafness, you by law, because of that equal opportunity tag statement, you should be able to get an interpreter. And that is on the employer and the hiring manager and the recruiter to see that you have the same fair shot to be hired as anybody else. And if you needed something like that, that was on the employer by law to be able to get that for you. So that was their way of unwilling, you know, not being willing to think outside the box or break the rules or however they wanted to look at that. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm sure so many. And you didn't, and you didn't know. Things. Yeah. And you didn't know. So, you know, you thought that they, they were in the right. No, I didn't think they were in the right. I just, I, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have, yeah. like what you're telling me, I didn't have that kind of knowledge of going into right. it to actually right. be able to argue my point. I knew I was yeah. right, but I, like, what do I do? Do I make it worse and they really won't hire me by me just being really annoyed and pissed off and hurt and embarrassed in a way? Um, right. And so, so yeah, it was just the knowledge that I lacked to make exactly. my point against them. Yeah. And so... And it's been said, so Judy Human is the matriarch of, of Center for Independent Living, or SILS, which are all across the world. And uh, Ed Roberts started the independent living movement in the 1970s, who helped create SILS, or Center for Independent Living. Judy was very young. Um, she has a book called Being Human. Uh, she is still very much a political uh, disability act activist. She lives in New York with her husband, who also has a disability. She has polio. And I suggest anybody that wants to read and understand, either watch Crip Camp, C-R-I-P Camp, 
Uh, it's up for an Oscar right now as a documentary that was released through the Obamas as executive producer and or read Judy Human's Being Human book because you will really get an understanding of where the independent living movement came from, what the ADA is, what the 504 crawl up the Capitol steps was all about, and how all of this activism in this early 70s and 60s really forced us as a collective group of persons with all kinds of disabilities. Right. Yeah, we were talking really about the pushed, other day. Right, that we came together as a, a whole group, not just the deaf community, not just the amputee community, not just the blind community. It was all of us that came together, and you really see that in this documentary of, of how we pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until, I mean, you think about it, it was 20 to 30 years that they fought and they advocated and they um, talked and marched and protested all across the country until that ADA thing. But yeah, and Tony that was probably Coelho, at a time when they didn't even really know we even existed. No, for the most no, part. No, in fact, yeah. if you see, if you watch it, a bunch of them in wheelchairs and walkers and and persons with blindness actually stopped at four thirty, one of the biggest streets in New York City at 4.30 in the afternoon, just lined up across the intersection and really shut down New York on, on this big intersection. Um, and it was amazing that they did that because there these huge, this one woman was a, a little person, she had dwarfism, and these huge trucks were coming right at her and would stop within a foot or two of her. Um, and she stood her ground. But she wanted to have her voice heard. Yeah. But... The one Tony Quelo was somebody that helped to write the ADA, uh, and he was a fen- he's a phenomenal human being for doing so. But he what does that stand for? He said ADA, to, to, uh, American with Disabilities Act. Right, right. Just wanted to so uh, everyone else knows. So yeah, to, Tony Quelo was uh, one person that wrote this this bill and said that the American with Disabilities Act got a lot of things right, but employment was one thing that didn't stick. So we have ramps and automated doors and we have, um, you know, closed captioning. We have 911, which really didn't exist until like, uh, until some part, mm, the fifties or sixties, maybe in America. Um, but we have closed captioning and open captioning and uh, translators. And when you go to museums, you have the headphones that'll, take you through in the museum so we have all these things that are part that braille? of what the ada like, like the braille on, yeah. the, on like elevators and stuff like that, that yeah comes from that okay. yeah that's all stuff you know accessible bathrooms in public spaces right yeah yeah, yeah. you Handicap know all stalls. these things that we don't even think about anymore are um part of the ada so in title five one of the biggest things is under miscellaneous one of the biggest things i never knew until five six years ago was that persons with disabilities, by law, under the ADA, have the right to voice their opinion and advocate and defend themselves without intimidation, coercion, or abuse of any kind. So if somebody comes up to you, and, you know, we've seen it in the last couple of years on video how, you know, there was a video of a guy in a wheelchair who went up to some guy in a Seven Eleven who was sitting on his car, hanging out in a handicapped spot. And the guy was coming by and said something along the line of, hey, you can't park there. And by the end of this kerfuffle, the able-bodied guy literally tore the amputee or the, the wheelchair user out of his seat, threw him on the ground, and threw his chair across the parking lot. And in so many ways, including the ADA, this broke the law. Because the guy was just informing the guy, the able-bodied person, that he was not supposed to be parking there. And the problem is society doesn't see us. No. And they don't hear us. And they don't care for whatever reason. Right. I mean, I had something happen to me just last summer. Um, I couldn't get in my Volvo because some guy parked in the stripey zone right next to a handicapped spot. And he was waiting for his wife to come out of the grocery store. I said, but I can't get in my Volvo. I was on crutches. It was raining. I said, I can't get out of the car. I can't get in my car to go get my husband to get the grocery. And I said, you have to get out. You have to move. You know, are you disabled? He's like, no. 
I'm like, we have to move because I can't get in my car. And and he was like giving me shit, you know, and just like, blah, blah, blah. and I, I pounded on his. I could tell this really cut. bothers you. <laughs> yeah. And I pounded, and it's the first time it really happened to me like this. Right. He actually, in the rain, on crutches, in front of my husband at the front of the grocery store across the parking lot, he, he hit the gas. And he came within inches of me, Rob said, my husband. And and he gunned it to come towards me. As if, and I said, my husband left the grocery cart and came running over and started screaming at this guy. And I think it was an eye-opener for my husband because it was the first time he saw how society can treat us. And I said to him later when I calmed down, I said, what did I do when he did that? He's like, you didn't flinch. You didn't unlock your eyes from him. You stayed focused on his on his eyes the whole time he came towards you in that it was a it was a hemi truck. It was like a big, and I'm only five foot one. So if you can imagine, <laughs> you know, somebody five foot one with a hemi truck coming towards you and you don't even move, I mean, I had to stand my ground because if I would have flinched, he would have known that he could have pushed my button and that he could have, you know, right, he could have taken advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, I I said to him, if you don't move, I'm going to call the police, and I'm not kidding. So I'll stand here until you move, and that's when he came at me. But see, that's that's the difference, though. I mean, you're just a very strong person, which is, you know, amazing. But a lot of people right. would do what you didn't do. They would do the opposite. They would just walk or, I mean, they wouldn't even want the yeah. attention of the I fact. know. And, I mean, I think, honestly, one of the things I've come to terms with, even I have a disability and I, 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 uh-huh. I try to change my perception on it as well. It's like, well, two things. One, I... I used to joke around with my friends and call them retards. I don't do that anymore because, and again, I'm not, right. a, I'm not a word person. I, I don't like censorship. I, I'm, I'm very out there and I'm very open-minded and I have a dark sense of humor, but I try not to do that because I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a people that really can't stand up for themselves. And I, and, and I'm, even if I'm, even I'm in the context is me joking, yeah. I shouldn't do it. Um, yeah. but the, the other thing that I really learned, which is, is really recent, very, very recent is I interviewed a woman and she was complaining about how she gets mad, how people use handicap stalls and they're not handicapped. And oh, I, know. <laughs> I have done that because I love the space and I really don't like people very much. So I like the bigger stalls, yeah. so I don't have to be cramped in there. And I started thinking about it. Like if there is a guy who legitimately I can walk, I'm fine. If there's a person right. that really needs that stall, and I've never look, I would easily get out and give it to them. If, I mean, it would be an awkward situation, but right, right. I would definitely do that. But I've never been put into that situation. But then when she she explained it to me, and she was saying how you know she was sitting out there in a wheelchair and they wouldn't get out the like they she wanted that stall yeah. and she can't get in the yeah. others. It made me really feel shit. And again, I know my contact. And I did never even thought of it, but even yeah, as a person with thing. a disability. I didn't even consider it. And I'm just like, you know what? Like that. Yeah. Like there's a reason why that stall is there. And, and I think some people just use this like, well, I'm fat. So I'm going in there and it's like, Oh, or teenage girls. They'll go in there and think it's a changing room. That too. Yeah. You know? that too. And again, yeah, it's good for that. I get it, but yeah, I get it. Right. Yeah. But you got to know what they're for. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that, that, that's something I've learned even as a person with a disability where technically yeah. I could play that game and go, well, yeah, I am handicapped. I'm, I'm, you know, by law, I'm a handicapped person. So I'm, I'm here, but I would never do that. But it's just, it's, it's something you even should learn. And that's why we, you know, the whole point of us is especially you and I talking and just the idea of all the stuff we're talking about is, is togetherness and inclusionness and, and, and all that is just too, show like we have to look out for each other and so yeah just because i can use that stall and i can manipulate the rules why like i i know that's for a person who can't walk and just like he probably could take advantage of something with sight he wouldn't do that because he knows that is something that would affect me so it's just like we should we all can just look out for each other and you know like i said like a blind and a deaf person together should be a very good i mean it's going to be odd but there's no reason why they couldn't work together. Um, right, you right. Can be the, I could be the ears, you can be the eyes, and we'll figure out the rest. Right, So, right. yeah, but go ahead. I'm sorry. It, in my last corporate job, actually, there was a guy who lost both of his arms from an accident, and and I'm missing my leg. So his strengths were my weaknesses and, and just the opposite. So, right, right. you know, we were, we were pretty much the push-me-pull-you yin and yang of, of getting things done in the office. So that was good. But, no, I didn't have a voice until – I was pregnant with our first son at 28 when that guy really confronted me. And the thing that I, I wrote about in the speech was in that moment, I realized that that behavior had to stop. 
his behavior as well as my behavior of accepting it and letting it go and not standing up for myself. Right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's really the bully mentality. It's like, even yeah. if you think you're going to get your ass kicked, if you don't ever push back, if you just sit there and he just takes your lunch money and you yeah. never ever say no, yeah. he's just going to keep taking your lunch money. And and this is on a much bigger scale because this is this is how people perceive us. So if every person, if one person could just take your spot and just say, you know, no, move, there might be 12 people sitting there in the lot staring at that and go like, oh, okay, whatever, something again. There might be yeah. three or four people that'll go, oh, that's wrong, but they're not going to do anything about it. They're just going right. to go on with their right. day. And they may even make the same mistake or, or maybe they'll take it to heart. But yeah, the, the rest of them are probably just going to go like, oh, okay, yeah, why didn't you just get out of the way? Um, yeah, because right. we're, we're looked at as inferior and weak because we have a problem. But the reality is, and, and I'm not saying it's just because I'm biased, but I would I would put our strength up against anyone's because of not physically, but, you know, up against anyone mentally because we have to go through so much. And that's why I always talk about like we're, we're really we really are like superheroes because we fight we, every we day. We are. We are. Um, we are naturally either born uh, if we're congenital or, or we learn to become problem solvers because the world was not built for us and to till today's society standards still is not built for us. Like the Oscar stage, you know, it, it is, um, we need to, we figure things out like my pregnancy, you know, and we figure things out how to do things at work and just, uh, and, and how to drive differently if we're missing a limb and or mm-hmm. have cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy. You know, there are adaptations in assistive technology that helps us, but we are natural born problem solvers that learn to adjust ourselves to the world that just isn't built for us. Yeah, it's and that's the bottom line. It's essentially like if you went, if you saw a house and it didn't have a door and you're like, well, how the hell do I get in there? Like, yeah. Like it didn't have a door, didn't have windows. And you're like, well, how, how do I get in there? It's like, well, we got to find some other way. Like everything, you know, or a slide without steps. Like you got to find a way around it somehow, shape or form. And right. we do. We're forced to. We don't We don't have any opportunity. We don't have any other choice. Um, and that I think that's what makes us so amazing. Like it's not It's not just because I'm, I'm, I, you can take, I could take myself out of it. It doesn't matter. Like uh-huh. I look at so yeah. many people and I just go like, you're, you're fucking amazing. Like you do this. Like I just interviewed a girl who she's, she's the only pilot with no arms. Like she flies yeah. a plane with her feet and, and she drives with her feet and, and she's a black belt. And I'm just like, yeah, like wh- Jessica, wh- Jessica Cox. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you know who yeah. she is. Okay. Yeah. I, I used, I used her photograph and her story in part of a speech I did in the presentation at work. Yeah, she's yep. amazing. She's beautiful in yep. every way possible. She's so strong yep. in, in every way possible. And it's just like, you know, how do you like how do you tell that woman that she's not worth anything? Well, because she's right. missing arms. Or you're less than. Right. You're less than. I mean, she was yeah. telling me how she gets into her clothes and I'm 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 so fascinated. Like I'm legitimately yeah. locked in because I, I I I'm not and I'm not sad for her. I don't feel bad for her. I just go like right. you're like you're you're fantastic. Like there's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with you. Like you're just, you're just missing one part of your body, but, or well, two, I guess, yeah. but you yeah. know, it's, and, and I like the same thing with you and, and, and all the others I've interviewed and, and, and just will meet yeah. down the road. And it's like, like, yeah, like, man, we just, we, we have to be strong. If not, like no one's going to be strong for us. We don't have any kind of coalition or any groups out there that are just like, I mean, there's some, I'm sure there's little small pockets and so on, but in general, like I said, before what we were talking the other day, like we don't have a black lives matter. We don't have a, a me too or right. whatever. We have yeah. little tiny pockets and little tiny groups uh, of individual disabilities or whatever, or, or just small groups of people fighting. But you know, back to what we were talking about earlier, 1.6 billion, there's no reason why we couldn't make noise. There's, there's none. Um, yeah, I think we were talking earlier the other day of how if we really, if every aspect of every disability got together, all 1.6 something of us, billion of us, right. would get together, we would be such a force to reckon with because we touch every, what did I say, gender, race, religion, um, economic status, sexual identity. Yep. There's not, it, it's so intersectionality. There's so much intersectionality to having a disability. I, I talked to 
uh, Liz Plank, the journalist out of Canada, that just the other day at work, and she interviewed for her book um, about masculinity and men. And this guy Darcy was a person in a wheelchair. He was black and he was gay, or he is gay, not was. But um, I mean, yeah, he checked right. off. Yeah, like yeah. he wasn't. He was Past like, tense gay. I'm sure. Yeah, right. But gotcha. he, yeah. <laughs> so he, you know, he he checks off three three boxes right there of yeah, you know, challenges, and and they all work together because it is who he is. Right. Um, yeah. So there's there's a lot to deal with. So I think we that's one thing I would like to see in my lifetime a more unified disability community. Even if I start not, of it, yeah. Yeah, because I, I do know that we don't get persons with deafness in our SIL, our Center for Independent Living, really, ever. Right. Um, and I found out from a friend of mine who, who has deafness that persons with deafness either do or most often do not see their quote-unquote disability as a disability. Yeah, they're they their just own see it as right. They just see it that they speak another language, and that's it. Now, some may see that they have a disability, but they don't see it as a a disadvantage. Um, but you know, I, I know so little sign language that I really wouldn't be able to have a conversation with with someone with deafness. Right. Um, but the same holds true for Spanish or German or French or anything. Um, so that, that's part of the problem, that they don't see that they have a disability, so they don't feel they need to come to our office for services for help. Yeah. So they're kind of in their own silo, like we were talking about the other day. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, before we like kind of get into what you do now, um, is there any like basic, just, just like the job stuff, like is there anything basic like you think people with disabilities should know of just like what their rights are and what? Um, you know, just little things that you think the average person with a disability does not know. That's probably should be very, you know, forthcoming. It should be right out there in front of them. Right. So I know when you go for the interview, like I said before, they, they by law, do not have to say anything about their disability. Just talk about the positive things that they have. Talk about their resume. Talk about their experience. And if they could talk about, give an example of, hey, this is how I did something. The employer or the hiring manager would be able to see, oh, they can do that. I don't know how they do it. They may do it a little differently, but they're giving me an example of how they're going to do something that's very relative to the job we're hiring them for. Um, once they're hired, they can tell whoever how much they choose to say about their disability. Uh, they can ask for reasonable accommodations, which typically really don't turn out to be very expensive at all. No. Um, but it is up to the employer and they... HR department to kind of get them those reasonable accommodations. Um, the ADA does talk about how um, flexible hours for doctor's appointments and things like that are part of reasonable accommodations. If they have, um, they need special space to, you know, access to get around, whether they're a walker or a cane or a wheelchair user, um, the office needs to kind of find a special space for them that's accommodating. Um, if they have a guide dog, we have a coworker that has a guide dog. She has a small office to herself where Yahtzee can um, be on a bed. We know when she's in harness that we don't approach Yahtzee. Right. Uh, so there's there's do's and don'ts for service animals and emotional support animals. Uh, so that um, that's good. I see that some large corporations do disability in are signing, there's, there's like 57 large corporations on Disability Inn's website that um, that have signed a contract or a, a corporate sponsorship coalition kind of thing to say that they are going to be doing more and better hiring practices and actively seeking to hire persons with disabilities at these companies. Um, so companies are starting to really look for active ways because they understand when they hire somebody with any disability, that person has been proved, proven to be more loyal than an able-bodied person, um, grateful for their job, right. work harder, right. and, and stay longer overall. Yeah, they stay longer with the company overall. 
And that's a proven fact, yeah. you know, on top of which, I don't know what the parameters are, but companies can and do get tax breaks for hiring persons with disabilities. Oh, yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about that, but... Yeah, um, I know. And they, hey, uh, some of it is... is I, don't want to get into too much into it because it's a company yeah. I work for yeah. that does it, but it, they get certain breaks for keeping us on social security. And there's, there, there, yep. you know, it's like, Oh, you have this many of them. And yeah, so that's why yeah. a, a lot of them don't it makes them look good. I get it. Right. Right. Yeah. No. So, but if it at least gets them in the door and then they get to know them and go, Oh, you know what? This really was a smart thing to do. I see the benefits of hiring this person with a disability. I think I'm going to hire more, you know? So, Corporate, large corporations are really starting to get it and understand it, um, but it, it's up to them to really pull their weight in, in working with that person and accommodating them and thinking outside the box, and that's where they need to come together, right. and the person with the disability needs to be, they need to say, hey, this is, this is what I need to do. What do you have technology-wise that can help me get there to do this? And like I said, it might be as easy as a, a, a back back relieving stress chair, you know, that might cost them four or five hundred dollars. And yeah. really, with the tax break they get, they can afford that. Right. And this kind of goes back to one of my original points of early in one of the early episodes of like, and this isn't to demean the other group, but it's like in order for these major things and tragedies in history, whether it's slavery, you need white and uh-huh. black people to get rid of. You, I mean, even something basic like. You are not basic, but something newer, like we want marijuana legalized. Well, you need non-stoners right. to fight for it. You know, gay yeah. marriage, you <laughs> yeah. need straight people. You know, women to yeah. vote, yeah. you needed men. It's not that men are better. It's not that white people are better. It's just you need the other side, especially if you're in the minority. Um, and for us, we are the biggest minority. So it's like we obviously, for before we want other people to stick up for us, we need to stick up for ourselves. And then we have to come mm-hmm. together and fight for others. But then on top of that, we yeah, we do need the enabled bodies. We do need everybody because, like I said, it's the problem. Like, you know, is another thing we were talking about the other day is that we bleed into every community. So we are, you know, I'm sure there's a few disabled people that are fighting in the Black Lives Matter movement or, or in the Me Too movement or any of them. And so we're in all those groups. But then we either forget about our other group or the people that we're fighting with forget about our group. And it's like, if we just kind of, if it's like, if we're going to fight for racial equality and we're going to fight for, you know, police brutality and, and whatever, rights for gay people and so on and so on, it's like, okay, now how about our cause? And then we just bleed into ours and then we, and then we can venture off. But then it's like, I feel like we need like one full, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, for us, I'm sure you know of it, it was a, a OVR. Um, right. and, and BVS, like BVS is like a branch of OVR. It's for the blind. And then they have right. ones for all different types of disabilities. What's like, well, why can't we have that as like a community where it's like we are one whole thing. And then certain parts of the year we, we march together or we have, you know, whatever parties or we do some sort of events where now we're a whole group. Um, but then through the year we're, we're fighting for our individual causes. And then, like I said, a couple times a year we come together and it's like, no, we, regardless of I'm deaf or I'm blind or so on and so on, we're together here. Like he's still my friend or brother or whatever. Um, and that's kind of like yeah. what, you know, I, I know you and, and I both would love to see, like, that's, that's where yeah. we need to be headed. So that's our call to action today that yeah. anybody out there listening needs to work and do their part to kind of bridge that bridge those silos and break that down. You know, maybe every July 26th right. when the ADA, we celebrate the ADA, it'll be 31 years this year, you know, that maybe that's what we do do yeah. at least one little thing, make one little change every year Absolutely. until it, until we come back full circle together as a unified community. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah. so yeah, so we, we keep talking about it, but we haven't really said, so what, what do you do now for, for a living? And then, you know, obviously I know you do a podcast and all that, but what, what is everything yeah. that you do right now as far as for yourself, for people with disabilities for, to, you know, pay your bills, you know, what is it that you do? So, um, for the last six years, I'm in my sixth year working in Berks County, Pennsylvania, at a center for independent living called a SIL. Um, I've had various, I started out as a case manager or service coordinator, uh, caring and setting up services and educating persons with disabilities and their families so they could remain at home with 
a care aid or a therapy or whatever they needed. Uh, that's our goal in a SIL. A SIL wants you to stay at home amongst your things and your friends and your family and your pets. So that's always our goal and our mission. Um, so I've done some PSAs on video through our YouTube channel um, for various holidays and such. Uh, so I'm the editor, producer, and host of Disability Talks, which is my podcast that comes out every two weeks. So some of the people we mentioned today have been guests or are, are upcoming guests um, on the podcast. And it's, it's a wide variety like yours that, you know, I believe don't just talk about amputation, talk about prosthetics, but talk about um, blindness, talk about wheelchair users and talk about a wheelchair user that's an interior designer, okay. you know, talk about a woman with Down syndrome that has her own cookie baking business like Coletti's Cookies, you know, talk about Jay Ritterman who fights and advocates through his family foundation for equality in Hollywood and throughout media right. for, rep, you know, authentic representation. Absolutely. So um, that's, that's my little thing, way of breaking those silos down, That's what I'm achieving to do. So I do public speeches. I do presentations. Uh, I've worked with Villanova University on the main line in their nursing department, and I'm certified in medical simulation, which is I, as a person with an ABT, go into their nursing students. Um, this coming week, actually, I'll go in twice and work with, I think three classes one day and four classes another oh, right, day. Yeah. Please explain this. Um, this is so fascinating when you were yeah, talking about the other Yeah, so day. medical simulations are a really cool thing. I don't necessarily know how I got into it. It was a, a fluke. But I go in as an amputee. Uh, one of the guys has had a stroke. Um, and we go in and we do these simulations, it's like role-playing. So I'll go in and I'll have congestive heart failure. Or I'll have a torn rotator cuff with a prosthetic. Or I'll have COPD, which... Um, is a breathing condition. So your lungs basically suffocate themselves until you pass away, which is a horrible way to go. But um, so, and, and the nursing students need to go through my diet, my medication, my vital signs, um, just all those different things and do a bubble assessment from head to toe um, and figure out, okay, they've got COPD, they have congestive heart failure, they have a torn rotator cuff. How are they, and, and the big one was pregnancy. So we wrote the first pregnancy obstetrics medical simulation in the country about three years ago. And so we do that one, and that's what we're doing this week. But so I go in and I do the story. The simulation is uh, I'm 30 years old. I just had my second pregnancy. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old at home. I'm going home with a full-term newborn on crutches. How am I going to get around the house? Or if I have a torn rotator cuff, how am I going to feed myself? How am I going to go to the bathroom? How am I going to get my pants up and down? How am I going to um, get my prosthetic on? And and I've tried it. And either way, whether it's my left arm or my right arm, I'm pretty much screwed to try and get my prosthetic ar leg on. So right. uh, God help me if I ever do that. Uh -huh. So, um, But the nursing students have to come up with, physical therapy or better diet or uh, change my medications. And I have to role play that I'm tired or out of breath or I've swelled up so much with my diabetes that I can't get my prosthetic on. Um, and, and they have to think about why that amputation affects that other illness, that other comorbidity. And sometimes I'll have my prosthetic with me. Uh, so, and I hand it to them, all 15 pounds, and say, hey, this is a very rare thing you're ever, you may never see this again. Look at it, ask questions, you know, pick it up, it's really heavy, do whatever you need to do. So I get them to think, because, you know, they're in their early 20s. Um, most of the time they have no disability or of their own, really, or know of anybody with a, an amputation in particular. So it's something they need to think about, and that's my way of, changing the way those nursing students through that university think about new mothers with disabilities or patients with disabilities and that hopefully they're smarter and wiser they remember some little nugget of information that they took away from that simulation with me or any of the other ones that come in to, to do these simulations. Um, because I want the next mother with an amputation or stroke 
or cerebral palsy to have a better experience than I did 22 years ago. Right. That's the kind of the goal so, is to kind of like yeah. the next generation takes care of the next generation and so on and so on. Yeah. And pass it on to we. So, um, but it, it taught me to have a voice and to speak for myself. And I was found that the students found it interesting and the staff has kept me around, you know, going on seven years now um, because they get such value out of it. But growing up, I never felt that my story was important enough to talk about because nobody wanted to hear it. It was something that you were just supposed to be ashamed of. So um, for those reasons, I love doing it because it really doesn't pay anything. But um, but I'm very proud to have those conversations and be really quite open about, you know, my situation and how I what I had to do to function as a, as a mother home for the majority of the day because my husband was off working, you know, and, and have one or two children with a disability figure things out on my own and be that problem solver that we talked about. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I'm finishing my master's degree uh, and just trying to maintain the house and my husband and kids and all that normal stuff. Yeah, you made it this far. You're going to be just fine. Right. Um, doing something right. So I kind of like in closing, I always like to ask the people who have been through a shitload. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. Um, to put it lightly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> if there's any, you know, other Shelleys out there, any, any, other it doesn't it doesn't have to be a person with a you know who's an amputee or, or anything right. just anybody who's going through something you know like i said they're at the beginning stages of yeah. where you were in the very you know when you had to kind of come to terms with what you have uh do you have any like any advice for them don't take anybody's shit there you go seriously i <laughs> i wish i wish somebody there's nothing wrong in advocating for yourself and if somebody just is a complete jackass just let them have it. You have just as much right to voice your opinion as they do theirs. Right. And you're not, you're different, but you're never less. Right. Yeah, I'd rather someone think I'm an asshole than weak. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. I, and, I, you know, and I, I've gotten a lot of crap for that as far as where I work because, you right. know, I, I've, I've been a person who, I, you know, I kind of was in the background. I was the person that didn't speak up. And then... I, I worked at other places, but I was the only guy with a disability. And then when I started working with other people with disabilities and it was like, oh, they think we're all the same. Like they don't even know anything that we're all different. They want to pay us the same. Yep. They treat us all the same. We're just a, a, you know, a statistic. We're just a group together. We're, we're not even, we don't have names. And, and that's no, it. We have really no identity. About, right. And, and that, that hurt me to my soul. And some of them I don't even like. <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like. Oh, like this is a problem. And then once I realized, like, I was like, uh, like I'm my, I'm, I've been fighting for my own individuality just amongst my own demons. Like, I don't want to yep. be anyone else. I, I'm just tired of like telling people I like something and I didn't or whatever. So I wanted to be my, I wanted to be an individual even in my own mind. And then I get here and I'm, you know, I'm in my twenties, you know, late twenties at that point, and I'm just like, oh shit! Like now I got to prove to these people that like, I'm, my name is Timothy. I'm not the blind guy over there with the other blind guys and girls. Right. So it was just, yeah. it got to a point where it just, it just ate at me. And I was just like, you know, I can't take this anymore. And there's, you know, one of my friends actually said, he's like, hey, you're kind of like a hothead, aren't you? And I'm like, no dude, I'm just like, doesn't this fucking piss you off? Like right. they, they treat you like shit. Like you work your ass off and they look at them like they, they take all the credit for what we do. Like, it's like, Oh, you give them jobs. How great is that? It's like, yeah, but that blind guy literally just went from three rooms over with a cane and just right. lifted up some heavy beam and did all this and did all that. And it's like, that's not amazing to you? Like, we do all the, the hard labor slave work and you look at us like we're just the little, and they treat, try to treat you like babies and, and, and all that. And it's like, no, man, like, this is not what it is. So when I say I'd rather be an asshole than, you know, uh, I, I lost my train of thought. You know, I yeah, I'd rather just, I'd rather be perceived as an asshole because it's like, look, I'm I'm not weak. I'm not going to be weak to you people. Like right. I, I don't, I'm not a tough person. I'm not trying to fight you. I'm not trying to do, I'm just, I'm just not going to let you push me around because this, that's that bully mentality that I just won't, I'm 32 now. I'm not taking that shit. Like I, I really yeah. am my own person and I just, all I want is my respect. I just want you to leave me alone. Let me do my job and treat me like you would treat the person who doesn't have an eye problem or, or whatever disability. So that's, right. that's why. You know, and if fight. you, if you made them, do an eighth of your job 
or live your life, you know, for a day like you. Yeah. You know, I, I said to the students at Villanova, you know what, if you want to know how challenging life can be, take one of your arms and put it through your sweatshirt or your shirt and, and you know, put it inside and don't use it the whole day. Yep. I want you to do your homework. I want you to eat. I want you to go to the bathroom. I want you to do everything without one arm. Right. The best part you would know. be to like somehow keep it in there where they're like, they can't yeah. get it out. Cause like, I know Don't there's people five minutes, right? Cause there's people, well, I, there's again, back to my job. They've done stuff where they, they wanted to test if a blind or a visually impaired person could do a job. So they did it blindfolded. And then a couple right. minutes later they take the blindfold off and it's like, no, nope, they can't do it cause we can't do it. And it's like, no, just cause you're that weak and you're that insecure. Right. And you, but it's like, but you have this realization of, oh, I could take it off and the light comes in. It's like that guy over there does not. So how about you allow him to give it a shot? Because if he fails, he's going to fail. But no one's going to be harder on him than that person himself. So it's like, you can't tell me what you stop putting limitations on me because life's been doing that my whole life. So just let me figure out if that's a limitation that I have or don't have. But um, yeah, so that, that's the one problem is like when you say to do that, like they're initially, as soon as they go like, oh, this is stupid. And they just pull their arm out and it's like, ta-da. Right. So it's right. like, if there's a way you and can literally over. lock it in there for, uh, for 24 hours, it's like now, now, now see how hard our lives are. Right. You know, and the thing is that they don't understand, <clears throat> employers don't understand when they're trying that is this is their first time trying that task as a person with blindness. Right, right. You you're already a problem solver. You've already thought outside the box in other tasks. So you're going to overcome that and learn tasks because you're, you've been accustomed to your challenges. They don't have any challenges. So, so they're not thinking of it rationally. They're not looking at it practically. Yeah. It's like an infant or a newborn baby trying to walk. Right. It takes a while. Right. You know, you've already been there. You've done that. I've done it. You know, it's just, you know, so I was what? I I was an amputee for 28 years from day one. And then my next big challenge was to figure out how to do it pregnant, you know, and and over and over again. You know, so, and then the next challenge was how to, you know, when I was a kid, how to drive. So that was my, you know, and you figure it out as you go along. But you just don't walk into a new disability like blindness or an amputation and say, oh, I've got this down pat. No, that's not how the world works. Right. So they're not looking at it practically. Absolutely. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, like, in close, like, you, you really, you're an amazing person. I think you're very, uh, you're super intelligent. So uh, you really <laughs> are. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, look, I, I, I feel like we're becoming friends, and I, I really hope we stay in touch. Um, I, yeah. I, I say that to a, like all the guests that end, but I literally, I am in touch with all of them. Like I keep the ones that weren't my friends already, you know, I stay in touch with them cause I genuinely love them and I genuinely have sympathy and, and just love for anyone who's battling anything. It doesn't have to be a disability. It could be addiction or whatever. Um, but no, yeah. I, I think you're an amazing representation of not only what I'm trying to do, but just of the disabled community or disability community. Like it's, you're a perfect example of overcoming but also again like not taking people's shit is a great thing um <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah when you put it in those words it just sounds like you're arrogant or what but it's like no nah, i know what you mean like um but yeah like I, I i'm very grateful of not only to meet you and to interview you, but um like i said this was one of the more fun conversations i've ever had with a person so i, I really appreciate oh, your good. time yeah no and you know how to find me on social media we're we're connected already on facebook so right and i have um, your number and yeah uh, um, so. and uh, you know, if you, if you ever need a guest, like I said, I'll absolutely do your podcast. Um, yep. like I said, yeah, but that's, we actually have to stick together and not only as people with disabilities, but as up and coming podcasters, we have to, like, that's another, that's a whole other problem. So yeah, we have yeah. to stick together so, in that. I'm looking to have you maybe in early winter or early next year that's at fine. this point, because I know I'm already booked out to fall. Whatever you so want. I just got to get a couple more people scheduled to figure out what's going to lay where in the fall. So right. yeah, I already had you floating gotcha. around in my head as a guest list. Fair so enough. That's cool. well, whatever you want, just yeah. pick a day and I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Cool. So, so until then, don't yeah. take anybody's shit. Right? Absolutely. That's the way we end it. <laughs> Thank you again. I really appreciate this. Absolutely. Stay in touch. Yeah, I will. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
eight guys. We're just going to close this. I don't know why I said hey because I've been here the whole time. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a dick. Uh, I, I've been uh, j- just quick update because I haven't I don't, I don't I haven't really done many updates on me or anything just because I've just been doing so many of these interviews and just kind of just just running through them. But uh, I've been trying. I've been taking a lot. I'm I'm looking to get into new supplements and but just like legit good ones, not these bullshit ones online. I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of research on what to take for energy and just uh focus like i'm I'm trying to meditate and i'm trying to take the i'm looking taking these vitamin d3 like five thousand count and just just certain things to just try to like i want my brain my it just doesn't focus it's i'm if you can tell sometimes i'm 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 really struggling for thoughts and it really frustrates me to no end um because i sound stupid and I, i hate it um but and so i drank a monster energy drink the other day i hate energy drinks by the way uh, but I, I bought a monster or I got one from work and I was, I was, not only was I happy, I was just full of energy. I, it lasted from nine in the morning to about nine at night, honestly, cause I got home around nine. So from bowling, so I was jumping, Ooh, but it, I felt good. Like it was like, Oh my God, this is what it feels like to not wake up and then want to go to sleep two hours later. It's like, shit. All right. So, um, and no, I do not recommend it. Start taking a shitload of monster energy drinks. They do work, but I'm not telling, suggesting you do that because people have heart problems and so on. I, I don't want you to kill yourself. Uh, I enjoyed it. I don't know. I'll be honest. I don't even, I didn't really love the drink. It was, it was decent, but it's really strong. Not strong, strong. It's just, it kicks in when it kicks in and you feel really good. But, um, but yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, better my not just like my, my mental health really just more the like i feel like if i can just uh have you know have, again have a little more energy and and um again see i'm struggling for thoughts uh like yeah if i have more energy and if i'm just yeah if i'm awake like i'm just gonna be more positive and i'm not droopy and um if i can focus and, and actually think properly like i, I don't know like i said the meditating it's it's kind of working a little but i can't fully lock in because i can't i'm always just like oh my god my footage is something stupid so uh anyway guys sorry i didn't want to take away from her episode because that was that really was fantastic and i enjoyed the hell out of that so um i will put her podcast in the description and everything she wants to promote um she's she's a great like i said great representation and uh we need more people like her. So I'll see you guys on the next one. And uh, yeah, we're just, like I said, just going to hit guest after guest. It's just been one of those things. And uh, I put something on my Instagram, but I wanted to say uh, rest in peace to DMX because not because it's topical, but simply because I'm a huge fan and uh, it's sad to see a person go and sad to see like, it didn't seem like many people tried to really help him in his addiction problems. And uh, it's sad to see, but uh, I go in more in depth on Instagram. So, uh, check that out. Uh, my blurred opinion. So see you guys and, uh, yeah, everyone take care of yourselves. All right. Bye.